Good morning. What a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you, Rick, and thank you for your friendship and hard work in this area. It's uh, a real privilege. Uh, I've worked with uh, the association uh, uh, before, and, and I just thank Rick and uh, Thornton and all the staff for their hospitality and their invitation to be here. Uh, Maureen is a good friend of mine, and uh, these are big shoes to fill, so I, I feel honored uh, to be here. Um, you may detect I'm not a native Californian. Uh, I'm a Scottish-Canadian Californian. Uh, I was telling a group this morning, that gives me a unique perspective on healthcare uh, and all things to do with healthcare, including death and dying, because the Scots see death as imminent. Uh, Canadians see death as inevitable, and Californians see death as optional, actually. It's a <laughs> so I'm uh, a professional futurist. Uh, I'm... Uh, my definition of a futurist is uh, an economist who couldn't handle a calculus, uh, basically. I'm, I'm in the sweeping generalization business. So uh, I will draw on that in the course of my uh, remarks this morning and, and my role as conductor. Um, I, I do share a, a musical background with Rick. I was a, a really bad drummer in a, an even worse band um, uh, in uh, the 70s. But uh, I've given that up, so I will try and keep the beat. Uh, but I think part of the role of the conductor, to take the metaphor, is, is to bring the best out of great players. And that will be my uh, task uh, today. Um, and try and weave a story with the baton, if you like, um, and make some connections amongst uh, our distinguished faculty as we go through the program over the next couple of days. Um, you know, I will say that uh, one of the great honors is not only to be with you in this room, but also to assure that all hospitals in South Carolina and folks across the country have the opportunity to join with us in learning uh, from today's proceedings. We're offering portions of the program through webcast, and we extend a warm welcome to our friends who are watching online out there in cyberspace. That is uh, a great way, uh, particularly, uh, to reach our colleagues who perhaps couldn't be here today. Um, this year's symposium focuses on creating highly reliable health systems that work closely with patients and families across the continuum. There's probably no greater task or honor to work on uh, this particular endeavor. And I, I have to say, uh, you know, I spent a good deal of my time on the road and I've traveled. I've been to probably 40 plus states since health reform uh, passed and had the opportunity to work with leaders uh, all over the country. And I will say that you have a reputation and deservedly so for the work you've done in patient safety and quality amongst other initiatives and particularly in pursuit of the triple aim through the process that is really uh, uh, exemplified in this room which is one of bringing together diverse stakeholders to focus on making systemic change through robust collaboration and I think that really is a true statement that you are among the leaders in terms of states who have embraced this and, and you should be very proud of that and proud of the innovative programs you've piloted uh, that have already brought significant change uh, within your state. Um, and I think you're well on the path to creating highly reliable organizations, uh, but we're going to be helped in that endeavor uh, this morning. Uh, we'll hear just in a moment. I'm going to make a few remarks, and then I'll introduce Dr. Terry Fairbanks, who will discuss how we can make healthcare safer by applying systems engineering approaches to medical practice. And later today, Dr. Josh Williams' presentation will focus on safety behavior, management practices, and advanced communication skills. So you're going to hear later on uh, today from two uh, national and actually international experts in these areas who will give you real rich uh, learnings that you can apply in your work going forward. Um, what I'd like to do before I introduce uh, Terry, though, is to... Uh, play the other part of my role as conductor, which is to sort of set the tone and set the stage for the context within which you do your work. And um, I thought it would be helpful to just take a few minutes with your indulgence to give you kind of my take on where we are and where we're headed, because this is really the why of change. This is why much of, uh, uh, of our work is on uh, uh, transforming the healthcare delivery system to be higher performing, as Maureen said, in terms of the triple aim. Um, and that certainly is the task we all share in the health system. Um, if you want to nod off for half an hour before Terry, here's the punchline of my remarks. Don't be sidetracked by all the crazy people in Washington, right? You can't control that. 
even the crazy people here in Colombia. You can't control that either, to be honest. Um, but what you can do is the work you do in your institutions. That's what you can control. Um, and you can do that on, on behalf of patients and families uh, by being diligent in your transformation of the delivery system. So as I say, if you want to nod off for half an hour, that's all you need to remember. Um, so let me give you my take on where we are headed and, and where we are with regard to the healthcare system. And I want to just do three things very quickly. One is to give you a little vocabulary uh, around this notion of the second curve, which is a book I did many years ago, but I, it's been used a lot by health systems because it, uh, the concept, uh, because it, it sort of speaks to the transformation underway. I'll give you a quick take on where we are with health reform, and then I want to say a few things about delivery system transformation, because I'm sure many of you are sitting in the roles you play in patient safety and quality, sort of aware that there's a lot going on in healthcare, but maybe don't see all necessarily the national picture. So I'll give you a sense of what we're seeing across the country. So the, the second curve is an embarrassingly simple notion. The argument is most businesses and most industries are going along quite nicely on the first curve. It's the red line. It's the business they know how to operate on a daily basis. It's where they make all their profit and revenue, but they have a sneaking suspicion in their gut that it's going to decline in absolute or relative terms. So the red line coming down might be growth rates or gross margin if you were in a, in a business. Um, it might be revenues declining, but that's less likely. Um, it, but it's really a change from the past, okay? Uh, the blue curve, the second curve, is a new business or a new way of doing business that is radically different from the first. Now, the dirty little secret of futurism is we cannot actually predict the future. Um, and there's a natural human tendency to overestimate the impact of phenomena in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. So what you do is you commit two types of strategic errors. You panic and you walk away prematurely from that first curve that you know how to operate. Conversely, if you don't start building that second curve, you're not going to be all around later on in the 21st century. Now that's the strategic dilemma that most industries went through in the 1990s, driven by globalization, new technology like the internet, and new consumers. We in healthcare were spared that transformation then. We are no longer spared that transformation. We are moving to a different world. Now, it's still uncertain and a little unclear what the outlines of that new world look like, but we're certainly moving, many argue, from a system which is fee-for-service oriented, where we pay for volume, to a system in the future where we pay for value. And value is a complex sort of notion, but it involves some measure of quality and access divided by cost, right? That is a different model than one in which you're rewarded solely for doing things. And the whole triple aim really is part of that transformation from the first to the second curve. So where are we with regard to change? Well, obviously, you know, we've got health reform going on. It's a big part of what's happening um, in the marketplace, and certainly with the election uh, we had sort of reaffirmation of the Affordable Care Act, which certainly has an impact on coverage expansion, um, although in this state, obviously, your governor has decided uh, not to necessarily move forward with both of the Medicaid and exchange initiatives. Um, certainly, nationally, there is insurance market regulation. Um, the future of Medicare, we're having a different debate than we would have had if the election had gone in a different direction. But what I would say is that no matter what and no matter who is running the country, we were going to have a debate about payment reform and delivery system reform. Um, the train has left the station uh, with regard to the transformation of the delivery system all across the country. In every market, there's been massive changes and redeployment of capital as systems become larger, or as we see doctors employed by hospitals, and that's happening at a very rapid pace, uh, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum. Now, you could argue that the uh, Obamacare or Affordable Care Act, whatever your preference is, um, uh, is home free um, in the sense that the Supreme Court could have derailed it, the election could have derailed it. I think there are two other hurdles that uh, the, the program has to overcome. One is the current spate of federal budget negotiations and whether there will be money available to do all the things that are promised in the act, even though much of the money is... is uh, already appropriated and can't be sort of rolled back immediately, but certainly Congress has been reluctant to give the president the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the dollars for implementation, for example, on, on federal exchange rollout and so forth. Um, the other thing is the whole thing could collapse under its own weight. I mean, it is a kind of a Rube Goldberg system of 
convoluted uh, pieces, and so the implementation could go horribly wrong. But make no mistake, there are some actions going on across the country. Um, what's interesting is that we're not necessarily all on the same page on this, uh, regardless, uh, particularly uh, in terms of uh, political points of view. I have a partnership with uh, the Harris Poll and the Harvard School of Public Health, Bob Landon at Harvard, um, and Bob uh, did a survey uh, in January after the election where he asked uh, with his partners at uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation and the Robert Johnson Foundation, uh, a fairly simple question about uh, the public's view of what we should do with health reform. Uh, should we accept that is now the law of the land and go on with implementing is in blue, and then on the red is continue trying to change or stop it. And you can see uh, a small majority of Americans, 52% of Americans believe we should keep trying to repeal it, um, and obviously, re uh, Republicans are much more likely to say that than Democrats. But interestingly, almost a quarter of Democrats uh, uh, say get rid of it. And the reason for that is they don't think it went far enough. So uh, it's not a hugely popular law, except for the things that are in the law, right? Um, and that's the thing that uh, we always point out. People like the individual elements of the law. They don't like the individual mandate. But almost everything else, majorities of Americans uh, support. But here's the problem. I don't care about your politics. Here's the problem you have to solve for. The average American family cannot afford the average premium. You think about that for eight nanoseconds, that's a wee bit of a problem, okay? Um, the average French family can afford the average premium because it costs half as much. Uh, and so what we see in uh, Papaka or Obamacare is that we basically have the top 2% of Americans, uh, those earning over 250000 a year, subsidizing to a greater or lesser extent almost everybody else. About two-thirds of Americans would be eligible, uh, American households would be eligible uh, for some kind of subsidy un under uh, the proposal. Now, why is health insurance so expensive? Well, because the delivery system is expensive. That's where the money is. Um, and so it's a convenient fiction that the insurers get all the money. They don't really. Uh, if you blew up the insurers and you took their profits and you gave it all to the delivery system, you'd pay for about three 12-hour shifts. So the money is in the delivery system, right? Um, and so if we're going to make this affordable, we have to bend the trend, as people say. We have to pursue the triple aim. We have to uh, uh, identify ways to be higher performing, more reliable, and do so in a way that's affordable. And that's challenging, because we, the public, don't want less than we get now. We want more. And nobody in the system wants to take a pay cut or be denied even uh, ineffective care. So that's a challenge. And I think one of the ways through this challenge um, is to demonstrate that we can create highly reliable, uh, affordable systems of care. Uh, just in case you don't believe the sweeping rhetoric, these are the numbers uh, for commercial insurance premiums in the marketplace uh, uh, on a PPO basis. And you can see, you know, $15,000 for a family when the median household income in America this year will be 50,000 bucks. Does not compute, right? So I won't bore you with all the, the provisions of Obamacare. It's a 2,700 page document. It's a thrilling good read if you haven't read it. It's absolutely riveting. Um, but at its core, it's a pretty simple idea. The idea is that we're gonna cover 32 million of the 50 million uninsured that we have, half through Medicaid expansion, half through subsidies to health insurance exchanges. Um, we had struck a devil's bargain between uh, the notion that you, the public very much wants guaranteed issuance, which means you can't be denied health insurance even if you have cancer. And to do that, uh, you, we came up with this bargain of the individual mandate. Now, the individual mandate um, is, is not the president's idea. This was an idea that was uh, developed actually in the 90s by some Republican and conservative think tanks who argued this as the alternative to Hillary Clinton's proposals back in the 90s. Um, I've always thought it was a dumb idea. Why? Because I thought we Americans would cheat, right? You know, the Dutch are required by law to buy private health insurance. The Dutch don't cheat. Well, they do. They cheat as soccer, okay? Uh, <laughs> we would cheat. You know, even us liberals cheat. You know, we all listen to NPR and nobody pledges, you know? So the point is that the mandate is very unpopular um, and is actually quite weak. I mean, if you don't choose to buy health insurance, the fine in the first year will be $95 a year. 
So a lot of 30-somethings, when they get the sticker shock of what it will cost them to buy health insurance, will cheat, uh, in my humble opinion. Um, so the good news about the bill is that it is actually paid for in terms of additional taxes on earnings over 250 grand and some givebacks by the industry. And there are some, quite honestly, promising pilots in terms of accountable care and uh, patient-centered medical homes. And you in this state have been leaders in, in certainly the patient-centered medical home movement. Um, so what's happening across the country? Well, what's happening across the country is that because it's not hugely popular, particularly in states with Republican governors, that many governors have said, no, we're not going to set up an exchange. You smarty pants in the administration, you guys do it. Um, and the reason is they ran out of time, right? I mean, you can't... Look, an exchange is not like a, a small appliance that you go get and plug in. It requires a lot of complex back office stuff. And so if you didn't really start any work on this, which many states didn't, you're going to be behind. And so that's what we've defaulted to in the orange parts of the country. And what we will likely see is two very different Americas over the next three years. I live in California, and those of us in the west of the country will be doing one thing. You in the Carolinas will be doing something else. And maybe it'll all sort itself out over time, uh, but certainly the initial next two or three year experience is going to be very, very different experiences uh, in different states. And that is also true in Medicaid, in terms of willingness to expand Medicaid. Uh, the blue states have made commitments to do it. Uh, the red states uh, have not. And their debate and discussion in the ones of mixed uh, uh, or, or nuanced color. Um, and again, I, I was saying to some folks earlier, I actually believe this is going to be like the rollout of Medicaid. It took 18 years for Medicaid to get to Arizona. Um, the Canadian system took 20 years to roll out across the country. So I think we're in a five to 10 year rollout if this is to be successful um, in terms of expansion of coverage across the country. Now, I want to point uh, just briefly to a couple of other uh, forces that are important to monitor. One is the behavior of private purchasers um, because they are not happy campers. I've been spending a good deal of uh, the last six months working on a uh, strategy for the Pacific Business Group on Health, which is a coalition of large employers, and not just Pacific. It includes people like GE and Disney and Walmart uh, and Wells Fargo. And what the big purchasers are in the midst of is a redefinition of benefits. There is a massive 10-year program of buy-down. What that means is essentially shifting the burden more to employees. Um, and so uh, big corporations are using consumer-directed health plans with high deductibles as a mechanism of containing their costs. They're also limiting their commitment to retirees, early retirees, to spouses, to uh, other uh, dependents uh, on the basis that uh, you can be covered, but you're going to have to pay for it. And so the burden is being pushed onto employees. Um, and when people have to pay out of pocket, they use healthcare services less, right? And that's one of the reasons we've seen reduction in utilization across the country. Many, not all, but some employers are looking at the potential for exit from private insurance if exchanges are functional. And there are both, there are two flavors of exchanges. There's the public exchanges that are uh, required through PAPACA, but there's also a growing movement of so-called private exchanges, which are uh, organized by benefit consultants to allow big corporations to move their employees more to a model of defined contribution, where people would be selecting amongst plans uh, on a private health insurance exchange, and that's growing and, and gaining some momentum. There's also a trend amongst large employers to go direct to organized systems of care um, who are willing to be in new arrangements uh, on a value basis, and that's encouraging, I think, for the large systems out there, uh, large delivery systems, the Carolinas Health, uh, the Sutter's in California, the Aurora's in Chicago. And then the other thing that we're seeing is a big move to shift responsibility to consumers to make more intelligent choices, to shop on the basis of value, to select among competing providers based on price and quality information, and to provide the tools for that to happen. And I think we're still at early stages of that, um, but I think it's one of, the, one of the key areas. And the other final thing they're doing is a much more activist engagement in wellness. The, the poster child for this is my friend, Angel, who is a young lady I met when I was teaching at, at the Public Affairs Institute uh, back in, in January. And she works for Lockheed Martin. 
and she does her 7,000 steps a day on her pedometer. And she syncs her pedometer every night with her computer. And if she does that successfully and does her 7,000 steps a day, her premium uh, that she pays for her health insurance goes down 800 bucks a year. Um, that's a kind of more activist engagement model that many, many, many large employers are starting to look at. So that's on the private sector side. Now, so if you think about what I just said, we're seeing major changes on the government side, a shift from volume to value in both uh, Medicare and the private sector. Um, we're also seeing potential coverage expansion across the country, or not, depending on where you are. And it works through what I call the hydraulics of healthcare. Now, if you aspire to be a hospital CEO, this is the only chart you need to manage. Uh, this is the hardest data in America to get, so I just made it up. Um, <laughs> So if you do coronary bypass surgery on an uninsured person in the state of Oklahoma, and then you send them a bill and follow up with a collections agency, you get seven cents back on the dollar in the state of Oklahoma. Um, Medicaid in my state pays about 60% of the cost of care if you're a cheap place, even less if you're an expensive place. Medicare pays typically in most states about 95% of the cost of care. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist, a futurist, or an actuary to say, you gotta charge the commercial guys a lot more money. And so, I don't know the number in your state, but in my state, that's 150% of cost. In Pennsylvania, it's 138% of cost. In Oklahoma, it's about 170% of cost. Um, in Wisconsin, it's about 300% of cost. Um, and then the dream is to get what's called the DSP price, which stands for the Demented Saudi Prince Price, which is what would a Saudi prince pay at Johns Hopkins, right? And that's what your CFO is called the charge master, right? <laughs> so if you look at this across the country, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to see less uninsured in those states that expand Medicaid and Medicaid, uh, uh, sorry, Medicaid and the exchange business. Um, but what a lot of CEOs in those states are worried about is they're going to have a lot of people with cards who are going to come to their hospital, but those cards don't cover the cost of care, right? That's a fear across the country, which will exacerbate the cost shifting um, to some degree across the country. Now, make no mistake, the states that are left behind in that regard, the cost shifting is going to be there too. It's going to be even worse, and you're going to have a population expecting something to happen from Obamacare, and there's no there there. Um, and obviously, the commercial payers, based on what I just said, are in no mood to just simply write a check for that cost shift, right? That's the key point I want to make here. So, many of, how many of you have heard about the Dartmouth Atlas? Right, most of you have heard about the Dartmouth Atlas. The Dartmouth Atlas view of America is on the right-hand side of this chart. White is good, dark is bad, right, uh, in this uh, crude uh, measurement system. And you can see on the left-hand side the view of America, same regions on a commercial insurance basis. And you can see an interesting pattern just in general, which is it almost looks like the reverse. The places that are cheap become expensive, right? Um, there are some folks like Texas which tend to be high uh, in both regards. And South Carolina is actually pretty competitive on all these national metrics. We're just talking, Thornton, about that this morning. You actually show up pretty well across the country in these regards. So it's against this backdrop of anticipated changes in payment, anticipated changes in the way in which healthcare is going to be financed, that we've seen this massive redesign of the delivery system. And what's going on is enormous consolidation amongst hospitals and physicians. Um, you know, doctors and hospitals are coming together to huddle for warmth in this uncertain future, right? Um, and we're seeing lots of new trading partners coming into the game. And the challenge now, I think the last two years has been about picking teams, right? Reminds me of being a wee boy in Scotland and rushing to school early so we could play 10 minutes of soccer before we went into class. And we wasted five of the minutes, five of the 10 minutes picking sides, right? All we've been doing is picking teams. Now we've got to play the game out. And the game is more complex than picking teams. Um, and we'll just say a little bit about that. So why have we seen this consolidation? Well, the world believes, the, uh, the financiers believe, the bond market believes that bigger is better, right? They believe you have to be a four to five billion dollar system um, if you're gonna get preferred capital rates. And that has caused a lot of hospital CEOs to merge 
uh, and build ever larger systems. There's lots of private cash out there, and there's lots of profit being made, uh, even in nonprofit systems. Everywhere I go, I hear this phrase, well, Ian, we had our best year ever last year. So many systems, despite all this doom and gloom, are doing very well. And there is this broader anticipation of moving from volume to value. And one thing CEOs tell me is that if I'm going to weather that storm, I'd rather be bigger. And I'd rather have a lot of cash uh, if we're going to make a transformation. So we're seeing a lot of uncertainty of health reform, but a lot of deals being done and a lot of systems being built where in every market I've been to across the country, the number one or two or three or four player has aspirations to get bigger uh, going forward. Now, you could argue that maybe leaders are a little bit ahead of followers. Um, you know, when we ask, we, we have these, this uh, partnership where we do surveys of different groups. When we survey hospital leaders and say, who understands why you have to make all these changes? Everybody's on board at the C-suite, the CEO, the CFO, the board, all in alignment that we have to move from volume to value. There's just three groups who are not on board, doctors, nurses, and patients, right? Apart from that, we're 100% behind this new program. Um, and I think that is really a, a lesson why uh, CEOs across the country have to explain better to the people who work in healthcare, why are we doing this stuff again? Because um, there is a little bit of an information gap. But make no mistake, we're seeing this massive amount of consolidation. Uh, part of it is fueled by a little wrinkle in a reimbursement, which is called provider-based reimbursement. In other words, if you are a cardiologist, and you do something on an outpatient basis, but if you move then to become an employed cardiologist in a hospital doing exactly the same thing in a hospital-based facility, you get paid a higher facility fee. That is a policy accident waiting to happen um, and is exactly why the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's latest uh, task force on this issue, chaired by uh, the great Bill Frist and, and uh, Steve Schroeder, formerly head of RWJ, um, came out very strongly that that's something that we should not do an old go-forward basis. And that, that upsets my friends in the hospital association, so I understand that. Um, we're seeing medical groups going for very high valuations, particularly uh, primary care docs. And a lot of people say this is the 1990s all over again. I don't believe that to be true, though, uh, for reasons we could explain. Make no mistake, doctors are, are not overly enthused about all of this. And, and we, in our surveys, find um, uh, three broad segments of doctors, about a third of docs quarter um, believe in all these changes. Uh, about a third are very resistant to them. And then there's the group in the middle who are not quite sure. So just so we're clear, this is not, I'm not just making this up. When we survey hospitals and we weight hospitals by beds, uh, you know, two-thirds of the beds in America are buying doctors. That, that's a big, big shift. And that keeps expanding uh, even as we speak. And we're at the point now where about a third of physicians across the country, by our estimate, we're in the field with a physician survey, even as we speak, I expect this number to be over 40% of doctors now are employed by hospital-owned groups. I mean, that's a massive change from the past. And fee independent fee-for-service practice is rapidly changing towards one in which doctors are part of organized systems of care. And there are other weird actors we could talk about including insurance companies who are involved in purchasing uh, various healthcare assets. And we're seeing mergers and partnerships of various types. No need in this meeting to go into this in any depth. Just suffice it to say, there's a lot of change going on. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of picking teams going on across the country. But here's the work that we have to do. And you are right at the epicenter of the work. The go-forward work involves clinical integration, getting physicians, hospitals across the continuum of care to work better, more closely, to be higher performing and more reliable. That work is crucially important and none of this will succeed if we don't make that work happen. We have to do it all on the back of contemporary information technology. There is no industry that has transformed itself except on the back of IT. And so I know many of you are struggling with deployment of all this stuff. I call it meaningless use. Um, but uh, trust me, uh, you ain't going to fix the health system unless you're doing it on the back of contemporary IT. Many CEOs across the country, most in our surveys, say we've got to learn to live on Medicare level of reimbursement. That's an aspirational goal. I see people nodding that I'm sure your CEOs are talking about. It's easy to say it's hard to do. 
because it requires taking 10, 15, 20, maybe 30% cost set. And others are saying, we need to move from paying for volume to paying for value. But how do you manage that business model migration over time? Particularly when we're very dependent on private payment for all the margin in the health system. But here's where the central challenge sits, which is building a culture of quality, safety, and accountability. And the best quote I got from a client, a chief medical officer, distinguished gastroenterologist who went over to the dark side of hospital administration, um, said to me, uh, and I love this quote, we have all the anatomy of an accountable care organization, but none of the physiology. In other words, we've got the pieces, but we don't have the culture. And I think what you've done in this state is, is build a, a culture of safety and quality um, across the state and with all your partners. And I salute you for that because that's the hardest thing. The other hard thing is finding a math to make it work. Um, you know, everyone likes, we're moving from volume to value. The CEOs all love that. And then the CFO is tugging at the sleeve going, boss, the math doesn't work. I can't make the spreadsheets get from here to there. And that, that challenge is going on across the country. Now, I'm confident we will bridge this gap. We'll move from the first to the second curve. We'll find a way uh, to that future. Um, but let me say, look, um, there's lots going on. I just don't want you to be sidetracked. I, I think it's important context to know that there's a lot going on. Um, but don't be sidetracked, but be rather empowered. As, as I've learned from my colleagues here, you're doing amazing work here because you're working as a community with other stakeholders to figure out how to make the thing work better. That's the work that is so incredibly important. Everyone's under pressure to meet the triple aim, but I am certainly convinced that health system leaders like you can make a difference, that you can actually, in your community, come together and identify ways to make it better, faster, cheaper, and safer, uh, and do it for the patients, and do it for the families of those patients um, in a way that is both compassionate and effective in terms of care delivery. And that's really noble work and a really noble purpose.